the queen critical thinking model. As you remember from your first lesson, queen stands for questioning, understanding, evaluation, explanation, and neoteric thinking. So for this lesson, we are going to focus on understanding. What is understanding? So we talk about a lot, do you understand me? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? That word is used quite a bit, but oftentimes we find ourselves when we think about understanding, it's because we have been misunderstood. So nothing is so simple that it can't be misunderstood. We have lots of examples, I'm sure you do, of text messages you've sent that have been misunderstood, the tone had been read incorrectly, or emails, or even face-to-face -face talking where you're trying to say something, but you're not conveying the message that you want to convey or you are conveying the message you want to convey, but the other person is not quite sure how to understand what you are saying. So as we put this in context and think about this in the mode of critical thinking, open your mind and I just want you to think about understanding. So I want to take you through an often quoted poem. You've probably heard this before, but for this segment of the queen model, it makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to turn it on and we'll talk later. The Blind Man and the Elephant by John Godfrey Sachs. It was six men of Hindustan to learning much inclined who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second, feeling of the tusk, cried, Who, oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp. To me, it is mighty clear this wonder of an elephant is a, very like a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. "'Tis clear enough the elephant is a very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the air, said, "'Even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. "'Deny the fact who can. "'This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan.'" The sixth, no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. Isn't that interesting? So when we think about that, I guess it's a poem, is it a, a folk tale? Either way, both, right? We talk about how our truth, we see it as the truth, right? Each of those men thought their truth about the elephant was the only truth. But what we see is that they are little t, little t truth, not big t truth. So understanding is coming to the place where you understand what your little t is. You understand what others little t 
could be. And then somewhere in the middle is big T, which is the actual truth. So one of the first contexts and components of this is context. So context are the circumstances that form the setting for an event, a statement, or an idea. So context is king. We saw this for the blind men. The context was where they placed their hand on the elephant, and that dictated what they thought was their truth. So we need to be able to really understand and assess what is the context. And it could be what if you're reading something or you're listening to someone, what is the author's background? So what experiences have they had within the subject? Framework. What framework are they working from? What is the setting? Is it a... um, a, it could be a, a for-profit or a non-profit organization, right? That could change what we're talking about. It could be a U.S. or an international context. That's going to change what we're talking about and how we're talking about it. The situation as well. What is truly going on? Is there a crisis? If there is crisis, that's going to change the context. So we really need to dig deep and understand. But also... As learners, we need to understand our own context. So for the rest of this lesson, we're going to talk about what does that mean when it comes to understanding? What is my context? What are the things that I need to understand about myself as a human and as a learner in order to think critically? So first of all is purpose. What is the purpose? So purpose is the reason or the reason something is done or created. So what is your purpose? Understanding that is important and also understanding what are others' purpose. So when we talk about self, it is not the what that you think, but the why you think it. So what is the reason? What is the why behind how you feel, what you think, what you do? And also looking at intention. So we judge ourselves based on intention. We judge others based on action. So we need to know what our intention, when we are looking at this data point, when we are listening to this lecture, when we are reading this article, whatever it may be, What is my intention for this? What is my purpose in doing this? Am I reading it for information? Am I reading it to add data to my already formed opinion? Am I reading it to see somebody else's opinion that differs from mine? What is my intention? And can you actually articulate those things? When you're having a conversation with someone, when you are discussing a idea in class or in a training, being able to articulate, this is my why, is so important because it helps you understand and it helps the person that you are dialoguing with also understand. Looking at others' purpose, you have to decode their why. So this goes back to questioning. You've got to ask those questions of that other person. Or as you're reading or listening, ask yourself, all right, what is this person's intention? What is the meaning behind what they are saying? What is their why? And so you really, at this point, need to make sure you're watching out for propaganda. So many times we kind of get sucked into different articles or different podcasts or different um, news media reports, social media posts that are propaganda. So we think that they are information, but they may be card stacking, which is focusing on the best features and then leaves out or lies about problems. So whatever context that you're reading, are they card stacking? Are they giving you all the facts? Do you understand that? 
Is it a testimonial? Is it someone who has experience or is an expert in the field, but they're endorsing a specific idea? They're not giving you facts in just plain words. They are pushing their own agenda. Is it glittering generalities where people use words or ideas that evoke an emotional response? Are they playing to your feelings? Well, if that's their purpose, then we need to take a step back and engage in some other critical thinking components, right? Transfer, relating a product to something or someone we like. Are they making connections with you and it's because it follows your normal thought pattern? Is it bandwagon? Join the crowd. Do what everyone else is doing. Think the way everyone else is thinking. That can be used a lot when we talk about different types of media. And is it just straight out name calling? Is it negative? Does it connect a person, product, or idea to something negative? So as learners, we need to understand the purpose of others and their agendas. Then we need to look for alternative views. Everyone sees the world differently. So this cartoon, you know, we talk about all the time, is the glass half full? Is the glass half empty? Are you thirsty? Are you not thirsty? Does that impact what's going on? Taking a look at, you know, those different um, visual, uh, well, like, do you see the vase or do you see the man? You know what I'm talking about. So those type of things, how do you see it? Is the dress blue or is the dress white? All of those different things that go around talk about those different alternative views. So in order to engage in critical thinking, we need to seek first to understand, then be understood. And you've probably heard that all throughout your life, but it truly is a correct proverb. We need to understand someone's view. I want to understand why you believe the things you believe, why you see that glass half full. The other thing is to be open to alternative views. So when you're listening to see why somebody believes what they believe, understand that their context and their purpose truly makes their truth. So be open to their truth. That doesn't mean you have to change your mind, but you do have to be open to the fact that people see things differently and they may be correct. You need to look for data verification. So we know that the algorithms for social media, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, Google, any type of social media will continue to put ideas, articles, posts, advertisements that follow your line of thinking. So if you click several times on websites looking for a new bathing suit for the summer, all of a sudden you get ads popped up in Google, in Facebook, in Twitter, in Instagram that are all different sites for bathing suits. It's not allowing you to verify the data or look for alternative views. It's just giving you the same stuff over and over again. And so you need to actively seek out alternative views in order to make sure that the data you've collected is true. Alternative views can also help you see your limitations on your knowledge. We don't know everything. We think we do. My 16 year old thinks she does, but we don't. So how can we learn? We learn from others. So if you're open to the fact that somebody else's experience, someone else's data may hold some truth for you, you're able to do that step. Who? this one's a big one. Let's talk assumptions. Assumptions are hard. Assumptions are natural. When we talk about what do you do when you assume? Ah, right? 
So one of the things that I kind of like to talk about when I talk about assumptions is this idea of a ladder of inference. And this comes from Peter Singe's work in systems thinking. If you're interested in looking into it a little bit more, there's some great books and articles about the ladder of inference and how it makes an impact on so many things from leadership to management to organizational culture to conflict. So it really has, assumptions have huge impacts. So the ladder of inference it says is that I experience and observe something and before I know it I have clicked to the next rung of the ladder which is I'm selecting data that I believe is relevant or true and I throw away everything else because I don't want to be wrong I want data that supports what I think then I add meaning based on my feelings based on my experience and then you go to that I make assumptions so I assume that my data is correct. I assume that I'm right. And I assume that my truth is the truth. I'm talking big T. So then I draw conclusions based on the fact that I believe I'm right. So on these conclusions, there's so many things that could go wrong if you adopt the belief, change your behavior and take action. So from observing that data, if you're not understanding what's going on, if you're not asking those questions, you can shoot up this ladder of inference and your big T truth most often proves not to be true. So be conscious of that ladder of inference as you're checking for understanding. Know what your mental models are. So mental models are how we see the world. It's the glasses that you put on that you look through and it colors everything around you. Are they rose-colored glasses like Conway Twitty sang about and it makes everything happy and sunny? Are you Do you need bifocals to where you can look in the future and also look and see what's happening right now? What are those mental models? What assumptions do you have about all sorts of things. So our mental models absolutely dictate so much of what our assumptions are. In ethics, we talk about ethnocentricity. So that's believing that your mental models are true and right and everyone else's is wrong. Now there's some merit in that. And we can talk about that in the context of leadership. It's great to think that your organization is the best and want to push that agenda, but we still have to keep our minds open and go back to that alternative views and not make the assumption that just because we do it this way means it's right. So ethnocentricity can be problematic, especially when you're talking about intercultural issues. And that's not just U.S. versus outside of the U.S. That could be also culture within what we're doing. So um, undergrad student versus graduate student, right? Two very different cultures, two very different ways of seeing the world and how it should work. Professors versus students, trainers versus participants, all of those things make up our mental models and can affect ethnocentricity. Then we talk about implicit bias. Explicit bias are those things that you are outwardly saying, I don't like. For me, I don't like catfish. I am explicitly biased against catfish. But there are some things that I'm biased about, but I haven't really admitted it to myself. Those are the things that you have to explore within to say, all right, is my gut reaction, is my assumption about this situation based on a bias that I hold? And it could be that you hold against the person. It could be that you hold against the organization. You know, when I think about implicit bias, one of the things I think about is where do you get your news source? So, so many people are all Fox or all CNN or all BBC or all NPR. And that is an implicit bias because you may believe that the reason why you listen or watch Fox is because they have the conservative truth and the crazy liberals over at CNN you do not want to have to deal with. But that could be a bias. You don't know that everything they're reporting at CNN is crazy liberal. 
just like the converse, people that are big CNN people, they don't know that everything that Fox does is ultra conservative, but we go in with that bias. Make sense? So let's talk about this next competency of understanding is complexity. Life is messy. The world is messy. It's not neat and tidy. And so what do you do when things are so intricate and complicated, when they are complex? You have to figure out what's happening below the surface. Don't just look at that duck on the pond, think, yeah, floating along, life is great. We all know that that duck underneath is paddling his little feet as fast as he can. So what is below the surface? What are the actual issues and how are they connected together? Then what are the impact and the implications of all of the complexity? How does one thing move to another? How does that impact? That is all part of deepening understanding. The next one is information. So when we talk about information, we want accurate information and we also want relevant information. And they are two different things. So accurate uh, information is looking at reliable sources. So sources that actually have some sort of a reliability coefficient that you know that are as unbiased as possible. Um, I, have, I found a great meme on, uh, on, I guess it was on Pinterest, and it said, um, you can't trust all the sources that you find on the internet. And it was a quote by Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> right? Abraham Lincoln, not around when the internet was. So you have to actually say, is this a reliable source? Is this somebody with an agenda. If you're looking for information on animal welfare, you probably are not going to go to PETA to get all of your information. You may go to PETA's website to get some information, but you need to have an alternative view, right? And find other data sources. So are these sources primary, secondary, or tertiary? So is this the actual person who did the research that understands it? Is this somebody who took someone else's research, digested it, and is presenting the information? That's secondary. Or is it tertiary, which is, I heard somebody who looked at the data and did their and made their own conclusions. And so I'm talking about what that person talked about, which talked about the actual data. So you have to say on that accurate, When we go down the chain, it gets more and more inaccurate. Think about that old game of telephone, right? When you would start and whisper something in someone's ear and it would go down the line and you would wait and see what it's like on the other end and it was never right. So when we're looking for accurate sources of information, we have to say, is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? When we talk about relevancy, is the scope appropriate? So is that person actually looking at what we want to know? Are they doing narration, which is being like a narrative writer, writing a story involving lots of descriptive words? Is it persuasion, where someone's trying to persuade you to do something? Is it exposition, where they're trying to nail somebody to the wall? Is the scope of what they're doing appropriate for what you are trying to understand? And who is their audience? Are they catering to a specific audience? If so, why? And how does that impact what they're saying? And if their information is actually relevant to what you want to learn. So I know there's lots of competencies in understanding. So when we go back, we're talking about do Do you scrutinize the context in which things are happening? Do you recognize the purpose of yourself and others? Do you seek to understand those alternative views? Do you examine your assumptions? Do you measure the complexity of the situation, of the information? And do you look for accurate and relevant information? 
When you do all of those steps, when you fulfill all of those competencies, you are able to engage in critical thinking when you're trying to understand a concept. So I'll leave you with a a good chess quote. Chess is not always about winning. Sometimes it's simply about learning. And so is life. So through understanding, deepening your competency and understanding so that you can become more of a critical thinker, it's not about winning, it's about learning. It's about understanding that your truth may not be the truth, that other people have great ideas. So how do we get to the root of what you think and what other people think in order to critically think?